This week in the parish of Bourses and Market Structure. Deal's done. TT buys Abel Noser in a super speedy completion. Tradeweb complete their purchase of Australian platform yield broker. And the biggest news of all. ICE closed the purchase of Black Knight within hours of the FTC confirming they were permitting the deal at last. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, episode 210. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the many events and happenings from the past seven days can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter, the unique guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. In BitCarnage this week, cheer up the worst is yet to come when one of our many fascinating headlines, the Crypto Kitties and even the Brussels Bugle continue to trumpet their perception that Grayscale's procedural win in court amounts to more than the Pyrrhic victory that we've perceived. Thus too, in their celebrations that it will soon be back to partying like a distributed Russian, these folk miss the point we made previously. When the SEC seals stuff in court... The odds are it certainly isn't a birthday card and cake for CZ's birthday or some such like event. John Reed Stark has been echoing our view that sealing docs in the Binance case could suggest a criminal probe that was on X Twitter. With 35 for now secret exhibits plus 37 supportive submissions, I wouldn't suggest this is the sort of stuff a few X tweets of forfad can rapidly disperse. Stark has made good points. As a civil litigant, SEC usually doesn't seal. Why would they seal? The clear inference, as we've noted throughout the course of the last week in BitCarnage, must be that somewhere behind this process lies criminal charges. Meanwhile, if they run a game show for America's most exasperated right now, I believe Judge Lewis Kaplan would only have to wander on stage, say the acronyms SBF and FTX, in order to have the judges backlight the auditorium with green ticks all round as he proceeds unimpeded to the grand final with ultra-low latency alacrity. The latest from the Dream Team representing SBF is that they reckon the DOJ are acting in bad faith because they are, from what I can see, and indeed what Judge Kaplan can see, in greater detail and with a vastly more astute legal standing, is that the DOJ are doing their jobs to prosecute the one-time boy prince of crypto. Thus, we are on tenterhooks, as I record this podcast, waiting and watching to see if there will be a trial postponement request, as the defence apparently reckon SBF is not having a fair go at blamestorming his woes on anybody but himself. Meanwhile, in a statement which doesn't need any further comment but may deserve outright derision, there is the... Decrypt headline, Binance is way ahead of the game on US regulations, says CZ. Maybe the notion Binance is way ahead of the game in terms of regulatory compliance is what the US SEC sealed in their court documents last week. I know, I know, everything is FUD in the CZ mindset when it involves not acquiescing to his worldview that every day Binance is stronger. If you enjoyed this excerpt, you may be interested to know that you can read BitCarnage every day and exchange invest. Alternatively, if you want to follow BitCarnage as a standalone, the daily update on happenings in the world of crypto and digital assets, you can find us on Substack. In the world of legacy exchanges this week, one piece of exciting news from one of the useful industry associations, CCP12, having grown beyond the original dozen clearing houses who formulated the association, has rebranded to CCP Global. A fair point, as CCP12 have credibly established themselves as the world body for CCPs without comparison. Meanwhile, in results, it was a frantic week for results in the parish. All the details were on Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. For the sake of this podcast, let's look at just a couple of edited highlights. Nairobi Securities Exchange, incredible numbers there. The profit rallied 72% on income from trading. Meanwhile, moving swiftly through the numbers from Compagnie Financière Tradition, 
SGX, they increased their dividend from Singapore dollars 8 cents to 8.5 Singapore cents, whereas, and this is truly a tragedy, ASX is reducing its dividend from 1.2 Australian dollars to 1.12 Australian dollars, a drop of 8 Australian dollars cents, pretty much the same as the entire dividend of the SGX. The ASX has lost the better part of $300 million on a chess debacle, plus endless reports, consultants, and other wildly unproductive nonsense, which has failed to begin the root and branch reform needed to organise the Australian dysfunctional market monopolist and probably spent more money on a dealing with denial workshop for the board. In the meantime, the dividend has declined, and this, of course, was supposed to be the ultimate monopoly milking dividend strategy. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Monopoly milking dividend strategies never work because even when you're a monopolist, somehow or another, you manage to screw up even without proper competition. With a broad, deep monopoly, ASX cannot even milk their monopoly efficiently. It's time to break the silo, but the government powers that be are apparently gutless. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome wherever you find this podcast. In deal news, well, it was a frantic week for deals in the parish. All of the deals were, of course, in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. Let's look at the big three of the week. Tradeweb, they completed their acquisition of Yield Broker, thus taking away an asset which was partly owned by the Australian Stock Exchange. And the Australian Stock Exchange only reported a modest loss pro rata, nothing like the chest debacle. While Tradeweb have improved their footprint down under, Trading Technologies completed their acquisition of Abel Noser in short order, having only announced the deal as recently as August the 23rd, when it was covered by Exchange Invest. However, the big news of the week, and an even faster close, was Intercontinental Exchange completes the acquisition of Black Knight and announced, indeed, the preliminary result of elections made by stockholders in connection with the acquisition. That completion was accompanied by a conference call, and thus, finally, as we've noted previously, the FTC caved, I mean, I'm sorry, negotiated their way to a successful conclusion from the corner that they'd worked themselves into. And indeed, perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this whole tale was how investors spent ages convincing themselves this deal couldn't happen. I've no idea why you would bet against ICE completing a deal other than the unfortunate instance when a deal gets rumoured, probably by the target, such as the eBay transaction and sadly the stock analysts all start saying what a disaster it will be when they universally lack the vision of Sprecher and Associates. Great deal by ICE. Congratulations. Well done on making this happen. In terms of making things happen in the world of fintech, if you want to understand what's bringing all these building blocks together in the future, you should be reading my most recent book, Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. That book is published by DV Books and is distributed by Ingram Worldwide. Don't forget, while you're waiting for your copy of Victor Death to arrive, check out our live stream. Tuesday, 6 p.m. London time, 1 o'clock New York time. The IPO video live show. You can catch the back episodes on LinkedIn and YouTube via IPO-vid. And great news. Following our summer hiatus, where we had some magnificent repeats on offer, I have to say, most recently, we had Ira Harris just the other day. We've got a great live show for you coming up September the 12th, IPO vid number 116, Rainer Zittelman. He's coming back and he's going to be talking about the wealth elite. Speaking of the wealth elite, actually that brings us very neatly to this week's book of the week. It was written by the economic hitman himself, John Perkins. Confessions of an economic hitman exposes international intrigue, corruption and little known government and corporate activities that have dire consequences for American democracy and the world. It's a compelling story that also offers hope and a vision for realising the American dream of a just and compassionate world that will bring us greater security. Or, to put it in PLY speak, it's the equivalent of taking emerging nations and encouraging them to gorge at the all-you-can-eat buffet of dollar debt. Product news this week. Well, some quite fascinating monopoly discussion. It seems that in a court action, 
ultimately the spikes listed by MIAX, the Miami International Exchange, is being dropped due to some form of court action where it seems that SIBO have managed to reign supreme with VIX and impose a monopoly action. I have to say I find that remarkably scary and indeed a huge impediment to what is much needed development of the volatility products market. Hopefully MIAX will be back soon with something very competitive and indeed a great deal more modern to attack the VIX monopoly. Technology news this week, the ASX is going to be hosting its stakeholder advisory group meeting for the chess replacement. That sounds like a right old bun fight. At the same time, the RBA, the central bank, issued a joint letter of expectations to ASX. The Australian blob blind spot remains a tiresome fetish for overindulging rapacious monopolies, such as indeed Qantas, who lost their CEO this week somewhat earlier than expected, precisely due to some highly dubious practices that only a bloated monopoly would think it can get away with. Bloated monopolies? Oh yes, that would be in the same sentence as ASX, some might argue. Breakthrough sale for Expri, the technology vendor in the cloud, who of course were our guests on IPOvid76. ABAX, Commodity Futures Exchange, they're the people who are trying to create a nickel competitor, amongst others, out of Singapore. They have selected Expri as their trading technology partner to power their full suite of futures contracts. And this week in regulation, EU lawmakers are struggling to compromise on post-Brexit derivatives, clearing reports Reuters. The stubborn post-Brexit divorcee, spurned spouse vanity hogwash of the EU27 for years, has been the deluded notion of a clearing cliff to get London out of Euro clearing. Alas, the loony left and the loopy greens still hang on to this with a tractor production statistic allocation approach to CCP clearing. However... There are encouraging signs that the de facto centre-left of Europe, which identifies as Christian Democrat, allegedly centre-right, are starting to realise that the EU risks collective bank Harry Keary with such daft moves. Thus, we're approaching an impasse, and indeed, hopefully, a moment of enlightenment when clearing competition might be allowed, rather than the European Union risking pushing the euro over the cliff. Hopefully, common sense will prevail, But then again, as this is the EU, who knows? A massive week this week for career news. First of all, Corentin Poilvé Cledier has been appointed the CEO of the Paris arm of LCH, LCHSR. Excellent news with a keen inquisitive mind and an excellent line of communication to the powers that be. Corentin Poilvé Cledier is a splendid choice to head LCHSA into the future as a not clearing Euronext entity, but nonetheless with a very interesting line of business potential within the Eurozone, but part of the LSEG. Colombian Juan Pablo Cordoba was confirmed as CEO of the Unified Stock Exchange. It doesn't have a name yet. It's the conglomeration of... Well, they've called it Chilean Stock Exchange Holding for the time being, but it's a regional holding company under which the Colombian, Santiago de Chile and Lima Stock Exchanges will operate in an integrated manner. Watch this space for a rebranding once the merger is complete. And indeed, congratulations to Juan Pablo Cordoba on being confirmed as CEO, which we announced a few months back in Exchange Invest. And good luck to the newly unified bourse. Watch this space also for not just that confirmation of a unified brand identity in the near future, but I imagine more news on chosen vendors to power the unified exchange group. Meanwhile, in Sydney, the news on the street is that Michael Aikens, VP APAC COO will be leaving SIBO Group on March the 31st, 2024. Mike drove a mega efficient integration of the Chi X Alls operations into SIBO Tech, having been an original Chi X associate in Asia from May 2010. Filling Mike's cavernous boots is an internal appointment. Rylan Uherek, formerly a BATS techie acquired by SIBO in that deal, he's going to be promoted to VP APEC COO effective January the 1st, 2024, to allow for a smooth succession during the first quarter of next year. Rylan's post as APEC head of software engineering is now open to internal and external candidates. All the very, very best to Michael Aikens on whatever he's going to be doing next, which I'm sure is going to be epic for the parish as he remains one of the finest tech brains 
in the exchange business. Congratulations also to James Falk, formerly of Hong Kong Exchanges and also an alumnus of IPO Vid, episode number 73, author of the magnificent Financial Cold War and Exchange Invest Book of the Week. James has been appointed Chief Commercial Officer of the Central Bank of the Special Administrative Republic, the SAR of China, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. What a fascinating position. Then we come to the second and arguably... Well, a reference site is nothing to be anything other than mega bullish about. And of course, that was great news about their signing Abax for Xpray. But they've also got the most awesome salesman in the Bourse business joining them. Ulf Axman is joining Xpray as Chief Commercial Officer. I'm absolutely delighted to see that Ulf has returned to the parish, having departed LSE Group when their tech stack upgrade woes meant they could no longer support the notion of new exchange customers being sold the same kit as they're trying desperately to upgrade for the messy merger of all manner of assets these days, thanks to the dreadful Refinitiv deal. Anyway, back to Expri and their happy tales, with Head of Sales Magnus Almquist having recently achieved the breakthrough sale to now installing reference client Abax. There is an encouraging momentum for the development of the Xpre system, and it's difficult to find anybody with a broader Rolodex or more direct access to the people who matter in the world of selling exchange systems than Ulf Axman. Back in Sydney, ASX have appointed Jane Franks as their chief people officer to reshape their culture. I'm minded to revisit the brutal, even decades back, naked video quip on a broader Antipodean tableau with some more pinpoint editing. Specifically, I would say, what's the difference between yogurt and ASX? Yogurt has a living culture. The only question, I suppose, is which method LaFranks will use to reshape the culture of ASX, Axe or AK-47? Pure play, old-fashioned decimation in the boardroom or amongst the C-suite certainly won't extract enough of the aloofly ingrained culture of failure. And that brings us to the wonderful world of, well, big world, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll offer you a fun fact that will certainly get you thinking for a long time. Less than 10% of business funding in China is from capital markets. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe in recession now, but coming soon... I think there's going to be a mega investment banking boom, come what may, as the cycle turns for the Chinese economy in the near future. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, my name is Patrick L. Young, and I wish you all a great week in life and markets as the publisher of Exchange Invest and creator of markets the world over. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our program, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.